Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is it really is a pleasure, and I'm really grateful to be um, to be part of this. Uh, I've known about maps for a long time. I've never had the opportunity to engage, and and um, I really welcome that opportunity. It would have been great to be with you in Chautauqua. Chautauqua holds a, a fond memory in my in my heart. Um, uh, interesting story. Uh, my sister went to the Chautauqua Institute for Music during summers while she was getting her engineering degree from Union College. So she's one of those, you know, but uh, Chautauqua was a neat place and maybe a uh, rain check. Maybe we can get together and have a hospitality and um, and uh, have a beer together and, and um, get that full conference experience. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Speaking of the full conference experience, it just happens that the full NISJIC conference is happening this week. And that was moved from New Orleans to virtual, and we're trying to do everything we can uh, to make that the uh, full conference experience. So, you know, we stayed up too late last night, and we talked in small groups, and um, that was all fun. But I woke up energized, and, you know, I had a, a bagel that I toasted myself and a few grapes, and, you know, I was thinking about drinking coffee out of a paper cup, uh, you know, with, with a lid on it. But tonight for our um, uh, awards reception, I'm going to cut cheese at home into little tiny cubes. Like, I don't know why hotels cut into little tiny cubes, but that's what I'm going to do to make it feel like a conference. So anyways, I'm in conference mode, um, which gives me full, uh, lots of energy because, because that's where we really get to confer, right? That's where the word comes from, and we forget that sometimes. So let's take this opportunity to confer with one another, and, and um, together we're better, right? So uh, with that, I'll run you through a, a few um, a few concepts and a few things that are going on that are less a status report of what's going on and more just kind of illustrative um, examples which which go to our strategies um, and I think we uh, we have thanks mark for um, for uh, watching the uh, chat so as questions come up just go ahead um, and then uh, I'll leave some time to make sure that we uh, we get the dialogue going and, and we really are able to confer. So um, uh, I am the president elect of NISJIC and on Thursday I will take over as president of NISJIC. And that's kind of a personal debt to pay back. NISJIC has been super um, meaningful to myself for my career. Um, a lot of my good friends from around the country um, uh, are NISJIC members that I met through NISJIC. And also I owe a debt to our, to our taxpayers because NISJIC has helped us advance geospatial um, beyond where we would have without it. Um, so uh, that's been a, a pretty great thing. And, um, you know, you, you talk about being ready and willing and forget about the ready part. I'm just willing and we'll get ready as we go. So, um, so I want to talk to you first about uh, the geospatial ecosystem. And some people roll their eyes a little bit when I say that. And I kind of thought like, mm, is that a term I really want to use? And then I got thinking about it and I said, you know, in geography, we borrow from the natural sciences to explain a lot of the phenomena. Uh, one example is the gravity model, um, the interaction between two cities, economic and travel interaction between two cities is directly related to the size of those cities and the distance between them. If you hear the rumbles overhead, it's um, peacetime missions from the Stratton Air, Air National Guard base, which is right up the road here. But anyways, the interaction between those two cities it's the same as the formula for Newtonian physics with the gravity model. Um, if you think about transportation and safety geography, um, the interactions around a, uh, an intersection and the volatility or the safety or lack thereof of an intersection is directly related to the number of touch points which come in. We call that the valence of the intersection. And that is modeled directly after the valence of an atom and how volatile it is by the number of free connections it has. When we come to the natural sciences and we talk about the geospatial ecosystem, um, I like to think of uh, biodiversity. A natural ecosystem's health is measured by its biodiversity. And in our spatial environment, the quality of our ecosystem can be measured by the number of diverse inputs that we have. Most of those inputs in the form of data, but other inputs as well. If someone is in geospatial and they say, you know what, I've got it, Frank. Uh, I've got everything I need because I build everything I need myself. I bet that's somebody that's doing things less effectively and less efficiently. Instead, we rely on each other's. It's a collaborative tool because we do have to rely on each other. And it makes um, these events so much fun because we're surrounded with collaborative folks. So this time last year at the geospatial um, at the, at the NISJIC conference, 
uh, Bill Johnson, former GIS um, uh, NISTIC president and former and the first GIO from New York, my longtime mentor, um, gave a gave a talk, and he talked about the geospatial ecosystem in the term in terms of a jigsaw puzzle, where everyone puts their piece on the table, and together we make that puzzle. Now we can do a bunch of work with half a puzzle. You know, we can do a bunch of planning, and we can do um, analysis and triage work. But as we want our use of geospatial technology to become more and more realistic, we need more and more of a complete puzzle. So I personally am not a jigsaw puzzle guy. I made one once when I was a kid, there was a piece missing. I think it pissed me off and I just like never did one again, you know? So um, that's fine. But my wife and my mother-in-law, they are jigsaw puzzlers at times. They go in spurts where they'll get a puzzle out and before dinner, they'll have a glass of wine and they'll make a puzzle together and they'll, and they'll um, do their thing. And it's kind of fun to watch and um, that's a nice time. Well, a little story. My niece brought a new boyfriend over and this kid thought it would be just a hoot if he took a piece of that puzzle and put it in his pocket and made off with it. And that young man is no longer with us, right? So um, that got me thinking about this as I was talking about, I, was, I kind of gave part of the story at, um, at the NISJIC mid-year meeting. And um, I got thinking about puzzles and love, right? So data and love uh, in this case, data is just like love. It only finds its full value when you give it away. Right. And that guy gave it away. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I got to thinking also about um, am I sitting at the table with any puzzle pieces in my pocket? Is there, have I done everything I can to put my pieces on the table? Now, you might be looking at that and might not relate, might not be that relevant in your um, sector and in your part of the business. I fully do not expect. Um, most of your members to fly aerial photography and fly LIDAR and just put it on the table for free, right? But if you kind of know the mindset we're coming from, we're going to put some investment into that. And we're going to try to make our investments available. And I'll get to why in a minute. So much of what I want to talk about is really not what and how and, you know, the technical nitty gritty. That's one, it's not my area and not my contribution anymore. There was time uh, in my career when the what and the how was really what I was all about. And that was fun. But now I've kind of moved into the why and other people are filling in the what and the how. Um, I'll mix in a little bit of background just to give you some, um, some take on that. Um, my undergraduate work uh, was at uh, SUNY Plattsburgh and I studied, um, I, got a, I wound up with my bachelor's in geography, but it was really focused on remote sensing. Um, I flew around in, in um, a Cessna with a, with a camera system and ran the cameras over Lake Champlain and um, wound up in the woods with seismographs and whatnot, but um, it was applied data collection and uh, remote sensing. Um, and then I went on to uh, graduate school at the University of Idaho. But when I was applying for graduate schools, I remember that I had to write on the application a personal mission statement for what, what I wanted to, to do in my education. And that mission statement still holds up today. Um, and I remember it verbatim and it said, I wanna learn everything I can about how geographic information is collected, analyzed, and portrayed. And that still holds up, but it's kind of taken on a new role where I'm trying to kind of create that, um, that environment so others can do that. So back to that GIS ecosystem, I gave a, uh, a talk at uh, last year's New York State GIS conference, and I talked about the unique role that everyone plays in that. And I challenged the audience to know what you do and why it matters and be ready to say that in little sound bites of 20 seconds, two minutes or 20 minutes. And if you have an elevator, literally an elevator talk with the CIO or with a customer or whoever it is, you've got that sound bite that gets their attention and, and you move on. And, um, and I was going around the, looking around the audience and I said, hmm, is this related? Is, there, is this relevant to folks? And, you know, I saw our, our software salesperson there and I said, well, you might be sitting there saying, ah, Frank, I'm, I'm in software sales. You're not really talking to me. It's like, yeah, absolutely. I'm talking to you. We're relying on your tools in this ecosystem. And your job is to, one, give us a good deal and a fair price and good service. But two, make a profit so you're still around. We're relying on you next year. Same thing with our, um, with our contractors for aerial photography and, and elevation data. Um, and then I looked around and, and um, there was some management types there and um, like, ah, Frank, you're not talking to me. I don't, I don't really do GIS anymore. 
you know, um, I leave that to others. I'm like, yeah, I'm talking to you. You're creating the environment for the ecosystem. So, ah, Frank, you're not talking to me. I'm, you know, I just started my career and I'm just, I just digitized data. It's like, yeah, you're building the photoplankton for the ecosystem. And, and I looked around, there's some students in the room and, and I said, um, you know, uh, Frank, you're not, you're not talking to me. I'm, I'm really just finishing up my degree and I just need a job. You know, I got loans to pay off. Like, well, yeah, I am talking to you. You're the future, right? And all this is for naught if when we go away and retire, there aren't people who have carried this on and created the culture. The geospatial industry is not something that is just going to be assigned from above. So think about that for a minute. Only about 5% of the things that I've done in my career have been assigned from above. We have taken the pulse of our stakeholder community, figured out what is necessary to be relevant and make a difference, and then sought support to, for those programs. Those things that I'm now measured on are things that we've put in our, in, in our own path, which is pretty great, but it's a huge responsibility to make sure that we cultivate that culture so that that continues because we know we're we are, um, enjoying great return on investment and we're leaving things better than we found them. We wanna leave them in a sustainable way. Part of that I'll get to later is the challenges in, in continuing our culture, whether that's a culture within our state agencies, our local governments, or in your companies, or in your not-for-profits. Um, those culture um, things are one of, the, one of the things that we focus on. And how about this for a sound bite? I'll credit Jason Baum, who's on my team, Leaders are the stewards of an institution's culture, right? So part of this conferring with one another is to um, create more resolve around that. Um, these things are easy to not talk about, but when we're out in a setting like this, it brings it right into the front of our minds. We speak it, we live it, and, um, and others hear it, and we kind of collect mass around that. So uh, into a little bit of a change in pace here, you may be familiar with the relationship between scale and cost, right? And you certainly understand as you're, as you're planning to uh, respond to, um, to bids or, or you're planning uh, a budget that the larger the scale, the higher the cost. And in this case, you know, I've represented that as there's no axes on here, but it's a, but it's a logarithmic. It's an exponential um, curve that if we get to, um, a full representation of the earth in all of its detail, we would have infinite cost, right? Um, so where is that, where is the, um, the sweet spot on that curve? The other thing that I, that I um, occurred to me in, in preparing for this, and by the way, I've had a sticky note on my, on my monitor for um, ever since summer, um, just excited about, hey, what should I, should I talk about in maps? You know, I was writing these little ideas down, and I threw half of them away, and, um, you know, but this was one of them. But, one of the things that occurs to me is that along this curve, there are things that flatten it for a while. And so there's bumps, this isn't a smooth curve. And the example early on in my career is that so much of the geospatial data that we were using, we made it one to 24,000 scale. Well, that's because there was a source of what could be considered a ground truth at 24,000 scale. And that was the USGS quadrangle series, which we turned into the New York State DOT quadrangle series and updated. And you know, that was a, uh, not necessarily a plateau, but it was a place that flattened that curve for quite a while. Well, now our imagery and elevation programs are the things that are that new ground truth. And when we put those out publicly, they become the path of least resistance so that everyone mapping to those things, and they're mapping to those things purely because it's the pathway of resistance. Um, some are, are um, understanding that that is the best source, but others are like, mm, there's a source, let's use it, right? So I love to talk to the executives about, and get the questions like, well, why don't you just use the commercially available imagery? You're like, why don't you use Google's imagery? It's like, Google's imagery is great for what it, for what it is. And yes, we do use that when it's appropriate. We prefer to map features that are on the ground most of the time, and you know, in this heavily, heavily tree-covered state, um, even in uh, fairly densely areas, there's an awful lot of tree cover. Um, so leaf-off photography is necessary. But also, the interesting thing, one of the reasons we make it publicly available, is I describe some workflow where a school group, and a town, and a county, and a state agency, or two, or three, or four, all 
and, and, and um, some commercial partners all provided different data layers. And those data layers come together in some workflow and it all lines up. And I challenge like the state CIO or, or some, whoever I'm talking to to say, um, tell me any other technology area where you just have an environment where across all those agencies, your data just all joins. And in a database, it's just not gonna happen, right? You would have to ETL the heck out of that stuff. Why does it all just line up? It all lines up because we've shared that ground truth in a way that's super useful. Web services of imagery, web services of elevation data, um, downloadable data, and, um, and that's been the base we've, we've uh, connected to. So that scale and price curve, you're playing an awfully important role by allowing us to have that, those plateaus to stand on while we're climbing that curve. That's part of the strategy. I, uh, it's one of my crazy hobbies. I keep my life like overly jam-packed full, but one of the hobbies that gives me a great deal of energy is um, I'm a coach of a youth mountain bike team in the National Interscholastic Cycling Association. And um, I would not have connected LIDAR data and mountain biking. Um, but this is an area that's one of my favorite places to mountain bike. This is exit 20 on I-87, the Adirondack Northway. And we can take a zoom in here. And you can see there's the town pool, the Queensbury town pool. But these features here, those are mountain bike trails. And they're hand built. And you can see uh, some of that is just where the... Um, uh, where the earth has been beaten down by the riders and others been others have been machine built. I showed this and we have this statewide in its interactive web service um, and on an interactive web map. And I showed this to my fellow coaches at uh, last year's Mountain Bike Coaches Summit and they blew their minds, right? Like, oh my God, we can, we can do this and that. And they're, they're zooming into the area where they run trail builds and they're talking about connecting this berm with that berm. And I didn't know that thing was so deep here. Um, it, there was no real science being done. They were just looking at a shaded relief image, but we empowered a whole bunch of excitement. And it's a view of the world that they just don't get because you can't see those features through the tree cover, right? You can see those features when you remove, when you remove all, the, um, all the trees and you just show the shaded relief. So pretty interesting. So let me open the door and let my dog out. I predicted in three slides, so I want to come back. So um, there was Otto. Another fun slide for you here. I've got to move around so I can still see you guys. Um, why are we looking at pigeons with cameras strapped to their chest? Well, this is the Bavarian Pigeon Corps. This photograph was taken in 1903, which by the way, coincidentally, was the year that the Wright brothers flew their first flight. These are homing pigeons. Homing pigeons return to wherever they are fed when you release them. So um, this was used as a military reconnaissance and NADAR aerial photography on little tiny wind up aluminum cameras and they would fire an image every 30 seconds as that pigeon um, flew back to where it, was, um, where it was fed. So strategically they were feeding pigeons. So this industry is so wonderful. So many of the things that are just like mind blowing that I love to talk about. I throw in these little sound bites um, during my, um, my meetings with the boss about, you know, color infrared and how taking the infrared um, part of the spectrum reflects active chlorophyll in plants. So we do blah, blah, blah. I do it in 20 second bites and like, wow, that's cool. Like, yeah, that's, that's how we roll, you know, but this is the kind of innovation that has been happening for the entire last century. Um, and, um, and it just shows the innovation of the industry and how it just continues to progress. The people that were flying aerial photography from pigeons did not wait for the aircraft to be, to be um, invented and perfected in order to do that. So there's an awful lot of innovation that we can just do out of necessity while we're waiting for other things to happen. So just wanna throw that out there as hats off to your whole industry for um, 120 years or more of, of innovation. Now we've all kind of come around to the realization that GIS's front page news through our pandemic. This one, through, I, frankly, honestly, threw us a curveball. Every disaster, man-made or natural, the floodwaters, the forest fires, the um, terrorist attacks, no matter what it is, it seems like aerial photography, elevation data, property parcels are key components to this. 
This one, we're looking around like, hmm, you can't really see COVID on an aerial photograph. And is there a role for elevation in parcel data? And um, are the relationships that we have fostered with all of the folks who typically run emergencies, are those going to, um, going to pay off like they always do? And when this pandemic spread into the US, I said to myself, okay, here we go. Let's you know, buckle your seatbelts. We're gonna be in for an intense time as GIS specials. And I have only lost sleep over work, oh, I would say maybe once a decade, right? A couple weeks into this pandemic, I lost sleep over work. And it wasn't because we were overwhelmed. We were handling the requests. We were, we were feeding the, um, the press office, the graphics they needed, the illustrations. Uh, we were working the emergency management office. We were doing things like designing traffic patterns around drive-through testing sites, all you know, meaningful and, and good work. But the thing that really was this unsettled feeling like, hmm, I couldn't really put my finger on it. You know, there's more we could do. There's more contribution. Are we ever going, are we going to be asked for our most meaningful contribution? And some friends of mine from New York City um, were, were on a call with me and, and they really started to point out some things that I kind of knew, but they really illustrated those things. And that is, uh, there was huge differences in the spread of the disease and how, um, how that disease varied from neighborhood to neighborhood. Uh, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, people sitting behind their laptops, much like this, maybe they're ordering their groceries on, the, uh, uh, on their phones, and, um, and, and they're relatively low infection rate. And they can look out the window and across the park, and they can see a census tract uh, just a, a few blocks away where there's an entirely different socio um, economic activity going on and maybe people have the choice between either social distancing or feeding their family and they might be living paycheck to paycheck and they might be running the grocery store or cleaning the hospital or you know they've got to mix it up in the subway they've got to get to work right so those patterns all that stuff we have data to to understand all those variances and we could have put real statistics behind all that um, and, and that's the work that we, frankly, across the country, we're really not being asked to do. So, you know, we're, as GIS uh, and geospatial professionals, not content for very long. Um, so we started to talk through that. Um, and some interesting things happened. This little statement, the propagation and the impact of the pandemic is best understood in the context of space and time. That's one of those 20 second sound bites. You can say that, and if you say that with enough passion, people will listen. And it's very true. Let me take you back in time to 1854. Maybe you know of this story. Uh, it's worth repeating. And it's worth report, repeating in this context because it's a challenge to us right now. Dr. John Snow was an unusual actor. No one would have expected him to find the cure for cholera. There was a cholera outbreak in London. He was a surgeon. He was not an infectious disease doctor. He didn't find the cause and solve the cholera outbreak with test tubes and microscopes. He found it with a map, right? And here he has mapped a little black bar at every address. And for every death that happened at that address, we get another bar. So he can start to see the pattern. And this little uh, fuzzy graphic here from, from a, uh, a hundred and a half year old map says pump. He determined that all of the deaths for, from cholera were closer to this public water supply than any other public water supply. He was not accepted by his community and he um, took the handle off of that pump. And I'll run you right back through to where it was, Be right with you. And to this day, you can see that this pump is there in London without a handle on it. And um, that was what really created modern epidemiology. And I gave this uh, example to, a, to the School of Public Health uh, at Adelphi University and said, if you understand that, you understand how GIS can impact your, um, uh, your craft of epidemiology. So 
here's a couple challenging questions. Is the data on the specific propagation of the disease, the test data, available to those unusual actors, those folks that um, we might not have predicted ahead of time will have the novel ideas for um, uh, understanding the control, or uh, understanding the spread and, and how to control it? And is the data being released in a way that is resolute enough, spatial resolution, uh, for Dr. John Snow to have found that well? And largely across the country, the answer was no. And I'm not putting down anyone who was um, doing fantastic work in epidemiology, um, just saying that there's more to offer from the geospatial industry. There are people doing fantastic modeling, playing the cards they're dealt, um, trying to change their hand. Let's talk about that in, the term, in terms of um, accuracy, precision, and resolution. Now, those are probably terms that are really ingrained and the differences between those things are in your industry, right? But uh, it, maybe it's a, it's a neat stretch to then take that to understand how that um, might impact, um, in this case, the spread of COVID-19. So my friends from NGA, um, they, um, uh, I'm sorry, NGS, um, they, um, like to, to talk about accuracy and precision, where accuracy is telling the truth, precision is telling the same story over and over again. It kind of says it all. Well, resolution, our ability to resolve smaller differences or aggregate to larger areas, our ability to resolve is really what we're talking about, but in two ways, both spatial resolution, dicing up our geography into the appropriate size pieces to study those pieces, or slicing time and removing the appropriate lags in time. Let me give you a couple of quick examples of that. Here are two images. Don't worry about reading the, um, the text on these images. I got these from Rockland County. But the pattern here is zip codes. And these are, uh, on, our, on the left, we have um, COVID cases by zip code at a particular slice in time far more useful than the whole county being shaded as one, um, as one color. But then on the right, we see a pattern of the exact same data being aggregated by census tract. And it gives you a radically different view, particularly in the um, south central and southeast corner of the county, right? It's a very different story than you would get from the map if you looked at that by zip code. And it, particularly when we zoom in, look at this, uh, these two census tracts um, that I'm zooming into here in, in uh, almost the white shading. And um, they're surrounded by census tracts that are uh, much higher uh, infection rates. And how could that be? Well, the people that know the area know that that is a very homogeneous religious community, and they may have just decided to stop being tested, right? So there's a different action to take, a different help um, to, be, um, to be given by government uh, when you know about those anomalous things, why is that? Uh, why is those two sense? Why are those two census tracts standing out? And then we go further, and we take the same data, and we break it further, and we analyze it by census block group, yet a smaller unit of geography, and we see a still greater um, difference. And then that same data again is analyzed and aggregated to a grid cell, and the grid cells are at an appropriate size to really see um, the pockets of what's happening, but also um, uh, protect the privacy um, by not allowing any individual records to be um, disclosed. So that's just a great example of um, how, oh, and by the way, the, this pocket, these pockets right down in the, uh, in the south central part of, uh, of the county here, um, those are big box retail stores and big high volume shopping areas. And we're right outside of New York City, and this was a place that people were mixing it up, um, and it was a whole different effect than um, you know people going to a party or and uh, socializing, um, which was up in the uh, potentially in the in the northern sections of the county. So, um, if you're really going to take action and understand what action to take and understand the variances in what you're seeing, um, the resolution is really a strong thing to consider. Let's talk for a minute about the spatial resolution, or I'm sorry, the temporal resolution. This image is an image of the sewer shed boundary for the Newtown Creek sewage treatment plant. 
So anyone inside that purple polygon, when they flush, it goes to the Newtown Creek Sewage Treatment Plant. It happens to be 1.1 million people um, who live in that sewer shed boundary. How about a COVID test that every day can test the infection rate in 1.1 million people with one test every day? So we've taken that temporal resolution and we've sliced that into daily updates. Think about what has to happen if you're modeling COVID by hospitalization data. The number of different variables that have to come together and maybe blur each other's meaning and the amount of time it takes before someone isn't infected versus when that shows up in hospitalization data. Um, it, it, like I say, people are doing fantastic work sorting all that out. But if we're able to measure the COVID rate every day, and the, in this case, the spatial resolution is low because it's a broad area, but the temporal resolution is very high. Um, we can understand, we can understand even the um, asymptomatic people um, because they also shed COVID RNA. Now, the, the folks that are, that are doing this out of um, SUNY ESF, um, and there's other companies involved as well, but we're working most closely with SUNY ESF, have a way to determine um, there's, a, there's a bacteria that we all shed that's widely studied uh, and it can be used to estimate the number of people that that sample has been taken from. And uh, then you compare that with COVID RNA and you can get a rate of how many people per thousand or, or you know, your rate of uh, COVID infection. Um, to improve the temporal resolution as we go, um, you can go upstream in the sewer shed and have smaller and smaller units of geography and pull a manhole and test there. And now you have an increased um, spatial resolution along with your temporal resolution. And at um, um, SUNY ESF, um, they actually are testing every day in front of their largest dorm, right? So um, they're able to detect um, that there might be a COVID problem uh, before anybody even has symptoms. So pretty wonderful approach when you think about things and start breaking things down by statistics, science, and our mapping science is the spatial and temporal resolution. So with all that, what did I say? I've been four slides in, my dog's right here. I need them. Okay, sorry, I caught his tail in the door. He's all right. So with that, we, uh, we started, um, uh, I, I put a little two-pager together and I sent it up to um, through my NISJIC uh, colleagues and um, that kind of got some legs and there are 20 some organizations who signed on and uh, kind of co-signed this statement that we can do better with um, uh, and, and the GIS community is willing and able to um, provide some more value in understanding pandemics. So that's out there in the NISJIC uh, website. You can look at that. But we also started in cooperation with NAPSIG, that's the National Association of um, Alliance of Public Safety GIS, and ERISA. Um, we started the uh, National Pandemic GIS Task Force. Um, there is a link right here, which I can put in the chat later. And um, uh, that goes to a questionnaire where we have hundreds and hundreds of people participating in the um, in the uh, COVID response, everything from first responders to medical personnel to geospatial experts to IT experts. Uh, and um, they're, what they're asked to do, what, um, uh, what they're, the shortcomings of data, what's working, what isn't, that's going into that questionnaire. That will all come out in what um, is being called the, uh, the National GIS Pandemic Playbook. And that playbook, we want to line up so it's cross-referenced from other pandemic playbooks. So if someone is planning for the next wave or the next pandemic and, and, and looking at best practices and how do we line up um, preparation for a pandemic, uh, there'll be, you know, section six is all about whatever. If you need to know how the spatial data in section six um, comes together, then it references back to the uh, pandemic GIS playbook. So pretty interesting. One of the things that um, might not be uh, obvious to folks is that one of the factors around the spread of COVID and our ability to control it is how engaged a section of the population is. And that can be mapped. It just so happens that while the pandemic was spreading, we also were trying to count everyone. The decennial census was going on. 
And this is an image of census tracts in the New York City area. And they're shaded by how, um, by the rate at which people are or are not filling in their census form. And at this snapshot in time, this particular census tract, only just under 7% of the people had filled in their census form. So it was a, it was a poorly counted area. And that kind of got me thinking like, all right, well, let's compare that area and that dot I'm gonna hold steady. Um, let's compare that area with, what the, co with the COVID rate right there. So here's that same dot. In this case, the COVID data uh, rolled up by zip code. Um, we see that that is one of the most highly infected areas for COVID. Just a theory, but the question I ask is, if a group of people in a particular area are not listening to government when we ask them to um, fill in a census form, what makes you think they're listening to government when we say wear a mask? Those are the kind of things that we can bear out in the statistics, and we have statistics on voter registration and other things. So there's lots that we um, are putting into this playbook that um, can be brought together to understand um, uh, the lay of the land, really, and all the, the parameters around human behavior and physical characteristics. So, you know, it's, we, we've, we've worked hard to create a virtual representation of our world. And in some cases, I struggle to, you know, I, I struggle to hear the why in some of the messaging. Um, you know, I look at um, some of these really cool demos with, um, you know, uh, urban uh, um, landscapes that are, you know, you can fly through virtually and I'm like, yeah, that's really cool. but. Uh, I'm only interested if there's a really, really cool business uh, opportunity there or if, if we're really solving a problem, right? And it's, some of that started to click for me during uh, in, in the economic recovery after the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of business transaction that's happening virtually and the virtual representation we have of our world is really paying off. There's real estate transactions that are just happening because people have enough information through oblique photography and elevation data and data about the schools and and they can get a feel for what's going on largely because of the contributions that your industry is making. Um, so that's keeping the wheels on the economy. I'm really good friends with um, the head of the photogrammetry unit for New York State DOT and early on in the pandemic I called him and I said hey are you guys uh, working from home? I, you know you've got some special equipment. He's like we are hammered down. We are uh, the chief engineer came to us and he asked us to do everything we can to get as much of the um, uh, capital program out uh, ahead of schedule as we possibly can. And, and before a bridge or a road project is, is uh, let out for bid, the, uh, the design work is done largely with a photogrammetric base or a, or a high resolution elevation uh, base. So they were working in shifts and keeping social distance, but keeping that machinery running. People were home supporting them with QA functions. And, they, and the reason was that the construction industry, particularly highway construction, was one of the first things that's gonna keep the wheels on our economy. Um, what a great time to, um, to, to do major road rehab when uh, a lot of people are telecommuting and there's less pressure on our, um, on our road system but also what a great time to, um, uh, to, to keep that important investment in our economy going. So I thought that was an interesting development and your industry is at the base of this. In fact, your industry underpins all of what we do in uh, geospatial. So, you know, I mentioned that I had trouble finding the, um, uh, the need for elevation data and parcel data, well, that sewage data, sewer flows downhill, elevation data. And we have in the parcel, property parcel data in the assessment, just like an assessment um, record would show you whether your house is made of bricks or made of um, uh, wood, there's a field that says, are you on sewer or septic? So we can estimate the sewage shed um, and who's contributing and what areas are specifically affected for that uh, high temporal resolution. Um, and in this case, uh, the economic impact of having a virtual representation of our world has been really meaningful. So we are faced with some really grand challenges. If you've taken a look through a downtown area now, the amount of, of uh, commercial real estate office space for rent is um, at all time highs. Um, and we have some challenges in our workplace. Uh, I use Rochester, New York as a, as a really good example that gets to those grand challenges, but also gets to the resolution. 
So in Rochester, like many cities, there's lots of businesses that have worked and started working from home and they've given up some leases. Are they going to come back? Um, they may or may not, right? But I think a lot of businesses have realized that people can work and are happier and maybe more productive in some cases working from home. That has some great value, great benefits, like fewer emissions and, and um, quality of life and, and you know, things like that. But our geography has been impacted and will it continue to be impacted? Um, and in Rochester, you might, you know, they, they're, um, there might be some offsets there. Rochester has reopened the Kodak Industrial Park and, and there's some manufacturing going on that manufacturing pharmaceuticals that otherwise are made in China. Okay, that, you know, if you look at that as a city in a whole, as a whole, you might say, yeah, that balances, we're good. But then you take a closer look with a little higher resolution and you see that those are not the same geographic areas. Also the challenges in our workplaces. Has anybody started a new employee um, since COVID has happened? and uh, you're starting a new employee uh, remotely, it's pretty challenging. My son just entered the geospatial business and, and industry um, after graduating this spring, and, and uh, he started a new job, and he's working remotely, and, you know, he's, he's killing it. He's doing all right. But that's a different, how do you, how do you um, instill the culture of your company uh, while you're working remotely? We can. We just really have to think about it, right? Um, have we just totally shaken up our um, college uh, experience? Um, are people saying, you know what, that online stuff, I can do lots of stuff online and maybe I'll get some credentials and maybe I won't go for that full degree and maybe I won't go live in the dorm while I'm doing this. Um, you know, so there are, there's gonna be a shakeup in the, in the educational institution. Is our industry ready to adapt to that? There's gonna be some wonderful skills and some wonderful opportunities. Um, but boy, it's gotta, you know, somebody like me, um, it's a, it's, a, it's a very different experience from how I prepared myself for a career, right? So those grand challenges, I think together we continue to confer. We don't need to predict the future. We just shouldn't be surprised by it, right? So we need to be looking over the horizon to how we're going to um, keep, uh, keep the positive stuff going. I'll take just a minute to um, take a blast through the NISJIC advocacy agenda. NISJIC advocacy are those things that we've formally put together is like, these are the things we we're, gonna, we're gonna make some noise about and we're gonna put some effort into. The National Address Database. You know, I was thinking about this and we've been contributing to the National Address Database for a long time. It's kind of funny because I thought, you know, at first it was like, that's an altruistic kind of thing. We're doing it, you know, kind of just to be good guys, right? We already have the addresses. We need to get our job done. There are 9 million addresses in New York State. We make thousands of edits a week. We, in fact, we made 5,000 edits in streets and addresses last week. We made 700,000 edits since this time last year. How do we do that? We do that with 100 partners. Every addressing authority in the state works with us. So we've got what we need because 98% of our work is in New York State. But we provide that to a national database where it all comes together and can coalesce. And what's the value in that? Well, think about that in terms of the pandemic. There are labs who um, are processing uh, records from all around the country, right? And if those labs don't have to do something different for New York than they do for the other states where they're working, if they went to a national source that was fed by those, by that local data, um, then we're in good shape. Same thing for 911. You know, our 911 vendors, um, Really, yeah, they're, they're making a few bucks by doing one-offs, you know, by converting each state's data. But if the address data were all consistent in the NEM standard, they could provide their value elsewhere and um, we're just all more efficient, right? So there's value in these national databases. The next two things on the advocacy agenda are the Geospatial Data Act and the Digital Coast Act, both legislation that NISJIC pushed for. The Data Act was um, really uh, to compel um, federal agencies to work together, be accountable, and consider the needs of state and local government. And um, now NISJIC is, is uh, so now that that's passed, we've pushed hard on that, um, uh, is, is working on, all right, how do we assure that that's happening uh, in the most effective way? How do we assure um, that we're playing the right role throughout the ecosystem and the compliance to, the, to that act? And you might think, well, yeah, some duplication of effort those are contracts and now there might be fewer contracts. And again, we don't really um, take those savings and, and save that money. We do more, right? So um, the, um, 
the spatial data that was coming together, take LIDAR data. You know, 10 years ago, there was pockets and watershed here, or watershed here, different specs, a different patchwork. Some was available to this group and some was available to that group. We're taking all that data and we're making consistent products out of it. And then we're filling in the gaps. And by doing so, we're creating a need for higher and higher and higher resolutions. People see the value in that. And now they're, they're wanting a, a, there's a demand that we've created. Um, and again, we can't predict that demand. Um, so Geospatial Data Act, um, I think is a good thing for all of us. The Digital Coast Act really keeps the wheels on uh, NOAA's Digital Coast Program. Next generation 911, your 911 call won't get to even to the right answering point without spatial data directing it there because it's uh, spatial by its very foundation. Um, uh, the NAEP program, uh, we need to keep beating that drum to say, yeah, there is value besides um, the federal um, agriculture value in that. There is value across the country for lots of people with NAEP, and we need to keep that program funded. Um, and the next one's a fairly new one. It's near and dear to my heart. That's uh, data feeds from authoritative sources to wayfinding and GPS companies. The soundbite on that goes like, GPS and, and um, wayfinding apps have completely changed the traffic safety landscape in the country. Some cases for the good, I know I'm a better driver when I know that the exit that I'm looking for is up ahead and it's on the left when I'm driving through Boston or some city I'm not familiar with. But we also know that people are misusing that technology and blindly following it into all kinds of wacky situations. The data to prevent a lot of that exists and the workflows exist, for instance, uh, bridge clearance. Um, there was 615 bridge hits where a vehicle that was too tall for a bridge hit the, hit the bridge um, in New York State in about a nine-year period that were investigated. Um, we're not talking about the kind of bridges where, uh, where a truck that could hit it was so tall that it needs a special permit. We're talking about not tall trucks. We're talking about low bridges in a lot of cases. Um, of that 600, of those 615, 511 of those, the driver was following a commercial GPS that was not intended for uh, bridge navigation or for navigating a tall vehicle. They were, you know, it's for navigating your Toyota Corolla through the network. Um, some of those pretty grisly, right? That data exists. Let's get that in the hands of those wayfinding companies. Work zones, addresses, alignments, exit number changes, all those things. Um, if we get a data flow worked out with those companies, we have that dialed. So there's another piece of the advocacy. Maybe closer to um, some of the uh, MAPS uh, interest, NISDIC continues to beat the drum on 3DEP and, and just continues to make the appetite and the um, story and the return of investment um, all understood um, yeah, with 3DEP. Another interesting um, problem for us to collectively work on is uh, a term called differential privacy. This is really around how the census data after this decennial census will make census statistics available. And in that, uh, with differential privacy, they're trying to make sure that no one can uh, reverse engineer and get down to understanding something about an individual from what is intended to be in, in, in law, um, uh, more aggregate data. Um, but to do that, they are throwing noise into the census data. And in my opinion, gone too far, making much of the census data not usable at a level of geography below the state. So we're working with census and the, the network of demographers around the country to work out a process where we strike the right balance between protecting privacy and also having meaningful data to, um, to help run our, our environment. And then of course, um, you're probably aware of uh, GPS signal degradation with the FCC um, uh, allowing um, Legato to, to um, use the uh, 5G um, implementation at wavelengths that are very close to the GPS signal wavelengths and the potential of uh, causing interference and, and reducing reliability of GPS across the country. That's something that NISJIC is also taking up. So, I wanna leave you with a thought before we go into some question and answer here. And that is we spend an awful lot of time, spend an awful lot of time um, feeding decision makers. But 
every citizen, every New Yorker, in, in my case, or every citizen across the country is a decision maker. They decide where to work, where to put their kids in school, where to buy property. They decide where to start a business, where to write an insurance policy, where to plan the park, right? Um, which park to go to. They decide where to go on vacation. And if we can empower all of that, with good spatial data that people just start to rely on that floats all our boats higher, but at the same time, we're making all that activity um, more efficient. And my, my statement I'd make to our executives in New York is we want to move the dial on the economy. I can pay for my team's investment a um, hundred times over if I have some tiny impact that New York now is a more effective and efficient place to find a location where a business is going to be successful. And then once I do, I've reduced the site development costs. I've reduced the cost of these, the raft of seeker permits, um, you know, the, the, uh, the species uh, uh, environmental studies, the groundwater studies, all that. If I re can reduce all those costs, then um, I've made a more effective, more competitive uh, area in our state. And we've seen um, areas that are making their data publicly available are getting more economic activity and uh, the areas where the data is locked up behind a license or behind a phone call, um, in some cases, those areas have been eliminated from consideration, particularly just because the data is not available, um, not freely available without uh, any action. Um, so an interesting thing, um, some of that might sound a little scary, but again, we don't do less when, when we get more efficient, we do more and we create a greater and greater need for reality there. So um, I really wanna uh, again, stress how, how uh, pleased I am to make the connection with MAPS. Um, I'd love to get together, uh, maybe we'll take a rain check and having a beer together and, and um, uh, uh, connecting uh, in a full conference setting. If you come back, I encourage you to come back to New York, give me a shout, um, I'll be happy to come join you. and. Um, also, um, uh, plug in with NISJIC because um, I think you'll, you'll find a lot of synergies there um, full of, a, if, you, if you like this talk, hopefully you did, um, full of my peers from around the country and many of your members are already um, members of NISJIC and supporters there. So uh, we support that. A lot of the things, we don't really care who gets credit. We just want these things to happen because we're passionate about uh, the use of spatial data. So with that, let's see what questions we had. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that, that is a pretty strike, uh, stark um, uh, example in Rockland County. If you torture data enough, you can get it to admit to anything, right? Um, oh, so how do we com combat budget cuts um, uh, during these difficult times? Yeah, it's going to be difficult times. Um, I am going to do my darndest to make it very clear that our return on investment is huge and we absolutely will be caught in a unfavorable situation if we peel back on our support for spatial data at a time when it's more important than ever. We uh, certainly have life and safety implications. You can't run 911 without spatial data. You certainly can't respond to most emergencies without um, aerial imagery. Um, and we just, we can't afford to, um, uh, to take our foot off the gas. Um, will we have tough times? I'm already having tough times. And that's part of my thought about having to scale. Um, I've lost people to retirement and um, I don't have any um, prospects for refilling those things. We'll figure out how to get that stuff, um, how that stuff going. But um, we just have to keep those, keep that message clear. Now, one thing that we did do several years ago is we did a formal return on investment study for our ortho imagery program. So if you were to just Google search NYS ortho imagery ROI, it'll bring you to an FGDC page um, where um, we actually uh, accounted for return on investment. And we can put that out there and say, it does pay off. Um, and, and that showed a seven to one return on investment. That's just because um, that was the number of uses that we're able to actually go and document. If we dug deeper, we'd find 10 times that maybe. You know. uh, University of Idaho, go Vandals, right on. That's good. Um, pandemic playbook, okay. Uh, federal agencies, 
Um, so I have talked to federal agencies and the question is, are the federal agencies participating? Um, I have talked to federal agencies, federal agencies participated in our two hot wash sessions and have given us feedback in the um, questionnaire. Um, but one of the things that um, uh, we're going to, to focus on is the federal to state to local government interactions that, that have to happen. So um, yes, they're engaged. They're not um, uh, as plugged in into the um, actually rolling up our sleeves and getting the work done because they're completely consumed uh, with the good work they're doing. Um, but they're certainly a target and they are providing their input. Oh, so accuracy talking about big data. Um, that's, that's a really um, interesting, um, so we're talking about big data or crowdsourced data and how do you, do, how do, you um, do that in the same sentence? And I have one example that illustrates a way that can happen, but in general, it's kind of like um, if you had um, a thousand cell phones go over a new road alignment, could you take the average of all of their lines and find the center line? Probably, you know, it would take some statistics to really um, to really show that we've just defined the new center line of where cars are actually driving. But the example I like to use is um, on our address database. We make our addresses publicly available, and we make them available through an address geocoder. Well, we can have millions of transactions against that address geocoder, and those transactions can all be logged. We can determine that, okay, we're supposed to be getting address points because we should have every address nailed down and is backed up by the street segments. So we can determine that a thousand people asked for 10 Pine Street and we gave them back a street segment. So that can trigger an action where the big data drives authoritative data because now um, we know we're missing 10 Pine Street. A thousand people didn't type that wrong, right? So um, by interact, by exercising the data in, at scale, we can drive into and kind of triage where we need the highest priority editing work to happen. Yeah, so um, uh, the, uh, the idea of a new standard, and I like the fact that it's in quotes um, uh, compared to the 24,000 um, and uh, scale map, our, our surveyors, um, are, are they, uh, constituents in NISJIC, they are, they are not as much. Um, uh, in, new, in the state coordination, we have um, a tighter connection with our, with our statewide association of land surveyors. Um, and that relationship uh, in the past, frankly, was kind of antagonistic or we kind of ignoring each other. Um, and we've started really participating in each other's conferences and we realized that we both play a unique role in that, in that ecosystem. So, um, that's a good idea that we also do that at a national level, um, but it is happening around, um, that, that shift is happening around the states. All right, so um, that brings us right to the uh, close of the session. And I really appreciate being here and um, thanks for having me. Great timing. Frank, thank you very much for that. Um,